Hello and welcome to the Justin Center Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. And I just want to give you all a quick reminder that Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. So if you would like to help out with the things that we do, go to justincenter.org. You can donate to us there. And there are many other ways you can help out as well. You can contact people at your church or uh, those who you think would be able to financially support us and would like to see our mission continue, even if they're not regular listeners to the podcast or viewers of the YouTube videos or some of the other things that we do. Uh, so go to justincenter.org and help us out there. Now, um, today on the program, I'm going to be responding to a, a particular talk. So this is a talk that was given by uh, Bishop Barron. Uh, Bishop Barron, very well-known personality on on YouTube, but certainly not just in YouTube through his uh, Word of Fire organization and, and program. Now, this talk is one that I have been sent a number of times in the last, I don't know, six months or so. And this is this is a sermon. And so it is it is rather brief. You know, it's under 15 minutes here. And this is really a a polemic against the Lutheran doctrine of justification or the Reformation doctrine of justification more broadly. And what I think it does well is that it gives a pretty decent summary of what are a lot of the primary arguments and points that are made by Roman Catholics against the Reformation doctrine of justification or sola fide justification by faith alone. And I haven't done one of these kind of response videos uh, to to a Roman Catholic talk dealing with Protestantism in a little while, and I've done a lot of these in the past, and there's plenty in my catalog of uh, audio podcasts going back years on this subject uh, and other subjects with, with Rome. But I thought it was worthwhile to go through because it's been a while, and um, you know, I also think that it gives, as I said, a pretty good summary of some of the points that you'll you'll often hear. So I'm just going to play some some clips of this. You'll get the basic argument that he's making pretty early on here, and then we'll move uh, through the rest of it as he makes some more specific arguments. So with that, I am going to, I'm going to play this. Um, to be clear, what he's doing here, just to set the stage, he is, he's looking at uh, Romans chapter 13, and there is a particular text in Romans chapter 13, uh, which is Romans 13, 10, which contains the phrase, therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. All right. Uh, and well, actually, it starts in verse 8, but we're going to play this here. Has fulfilled the law. Hmm. The one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, let's go back to the beginning of the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther famously says what he discovered in Paul and in texts like Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and others is it seems that we're justified or saved, set right, not by works of the law, but by faith. So Luther says, by, by grace through faith, and he intensifies it by saying, gratia sola, fide sola, by grace alone, by faith alone we're saved, and not by the works of the law. So, Well, you know, kudos to him for not saying anything totally crazy. <laughs> point. Uh, you know, oftentimes when, when viewing some, some Roman Catholic polemics, you hear these just complete misrepresentations when people talk about what justification through faith means. And, you know, he's, he's, he's right so far. Not, not that I would expect less from, from Bishop Barron. He's uh, certainly an uh, intelligent and capable scholar and theologian. How come at the end of Romans, the same Paul who said that toward the beginning of Romans, here talks about love as the fulfillment of the law. Well, again, I'm wading into these, um, you know, stormy waters. We've been debating this for 500 years. I have no, uh, under no illusion that in 12 minutes I'm going to solve this problem. But let me see. Well, you know, apparently <laughs> I've talked to a couple people who told me that they, they left Protestantism after hearing this talk. No, really. I mean, I've received emails from people telling me that or, or a friend. Uh, I think one was a person who left Protestantism after this talk and another one um, had a friend who did. And um, it, it's, it was kind of surprising to me because listening to this, you know, obviously it's short. It's obviously brief. You're not going to do an in-depth exegetical treatment. Of, obviously, you can't within this, this kind of time period, nor is that really the purpose of a sermon anyway. But um, – this, this is pretty 
kind of run of the mill Roman Catholic argumentation. So there's nothing in here that's particularly unique. This is these are the same basic arguments that you're going to find Chemnitz interacting with, or even that you'll find Luther interacting with to to some extent. So nothing nothing particularly new here. This now speaking as a Catholic theologian. Yes, we can find those texts in Paul, indeed, that, that seem to indicate, you know, we're justified by, by faith and by grace alone, not by works. However, in the same St. Paul, we find texts such as this one today. We find a text such as... So, you know, this, the, the use of this particular text, I don't really see what, what the issue is on its face. And he's going to get into some more details about why he finds this particularly compelling. But... Um, I, I appreciate that Bishop Barron is willing to acknowledge that there are texts that do seem to indicate what Luther is saying, right? These, these things do not come out of nowhere. And, of course, there are complexities on this issue. And everybody should at least acknowledge that there are complexities on this issue because there are a number of texts that read in isolation could give the reader the idea of very different a very different conception of justification, right? So you have the text like Romans 4 and Romans 3 in particular, dealing with justification apart from works of the law or the one who uh, is justified apart from works, the one who does no works at all, you know, Romans Romans 4, 5, who is, who is justified. And then you do have texts that speak, for example, about the final judgment and the role of good works in the final judgment. And of course, you have the James text that we're going to talk about here saying, you know, not by faith alone. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that here. And of course, if, if you believe in the consistency of scripture, which certainly I do, then we have to find ways to make these make sense uh, with with one another. And so there is a bit of there is a little bit of complexity here in figuring out exactly how these texts are supposed to go together. Of course, the question is, uh, which tradition is it that has a harmonization of these texts that makes sense both of the the terms and language that are used in those texts and within the broader context of both those particular books and the biblical narrative as a whole. But in this text here, I really don't see any issue within Romans 13 that would even pose a, a difficulty at all regarding the question of justification through faith, because this text says nothing whatsoever about justification. It simply says that to love one another is to fulfill the law. And I'll, I'll read this whole section here. This is 8 through 10 in Romans 13. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So I don't really understand what, what the problem that's, that, what problem there would be in terms of the doctrine of justification through faith alone, because this particular text in Paul says nothing whatsoever about justification. He simply says that the love is the fulfillment of the law, and therefore Christians are called to love one another, and these various, you know, of the Ten Commandments are fulfilled in love. That's what we are called to do. And if this text said, therefore, we are justified by keeping the law, we are justified by love, then, okay, I could see why this would pose a problem. But it's not the case that Lutherans would say that the Christian does not begin to fulfill the law through love, where the love is not the fulfillment of the law. Certainly, a read of Luther's small and large catechisms would show that this is a, a, a very important element of our teaching in life. We believe that the law is the guide for the Christian, and it is summarized by love, and that in Christian love, we do begin to fulfill the law through the work of the Holy Spirit. However, that that beginning of a fulfillment of the law is not perfect, and that is not what justifies. It's because we are justified through the righteousness of Christ that we receive through faith that we then receive new impulses by the Holy Spirit and are able to begin in fulfillment of the law. So I just simply don't see what, what the issue is here at all. If you have faith enough to move the mountains but have not love, you're nothing. <laughs> I don't know about you. To me, that doesn't sound like I'm justified by faith alone. Yeah, again, this, this text is one that simply doesn't talk about justification. And it is talking about the nature of, of what, what the Christian life is. And it is true that if you do not have, have love and have faith or at least claim to have faith, then sure, you, you are nothing. There, there's no issue with that. And Lutherans have plenty of 
you know, commentaries on these texts and sermons on these texts. And uh, those particular commentaries and sermons don't just look at that and say, oh, but only faith matters, love doesn't matter. Therefore, you know, trying to like explain away the text. Um, the, the question is, what is being said within the context of justification? We're speaking about something very particular when we're saying we're talking about sola fide. Uh, what, what we are not saying is that, uh, in, if we think about like the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, what we are not saying is that uh, faith is the most essential of those virtues or is more important than you know hope or love. Uh, we are not saying that faith defines our entire Christian life in this world before our neighbors. What we are saying is, it is faith only that does one particular thing. It is faith only that grasps Christ, that trusts in God's promises, that receives Christ and his righteousness, and therefore justifies us. And that is not love. Uh, so here is where I actually think the text that's being cited here is a very strong text to defend sola fide. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you look at the entirety of the book of Romans, Paul has, and we'll talk about what works of the law are as he explains throughout this, this message, but throughout the book of Romans, Paul has consistently laid out the case that through the law comes knowledge of sin, uh, through the law every mouth is stopped, Romans 3.20, and that therefore the law cannot justify, the works of the law do not justify, and so what we need is to be justified apart from works of the law by something else. What is that something else? That something else is faith. Now, as we read a text like Romans 13, in a, an epistle where Paul has just spent a significant amount of that letter explaining to us exactly why it is that we are not justified through works of the law, here he goes on to define those works of the law as being fulfilled in one thing, and that thing is love. If that's the case, that love is the fulfillment of the law, as he says here, and that he even lists specific commandments, all of that is fulfilled in love. So Paul makes this exact equation of the commandments of God and love. Love is obedience to the law. If that's the case, then when Paul says things like we are justified apart from works of the law, according to the definition of the law in Paul's own, the same text, the same book, he is defining law as love. In other words, if we are really justified apart from works of the law by faith, that means that we are justified by faith apart from love, because love is the fulfillment of the law. So this text actually, I think, does the opposite of what Bishop Aaron is saying here. It, it doesn't prove that we somehow are justified by love. It, in fact, places love precisely in that category that Paul has already set up of the things that don't justify, which is works of the law. And if love is a fulfillment of the law, love is a work of the law, and therefore it does not justify. So understanding that in the context of justification, it does, it does not play a role. It is not that which by which we grasp Christ and are declared or imputed righteous that doesn't make it unimportant or even less important than faith. As Paul you know, says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13, he says that, uh, you know, faith is going to pass away. Like, what, what we understand today as faith is not something that is eternal. Love is eternal. And so there is a sense, then, in which there is a superiority of love, of, of love over faith. And that's even true in our justification, at least in one sense, in that my justification is through love, but it is through the love of Christ and the love of God poured out for me in and through Christ. So it's not a question of what is superior you know, faith or love. We even see texts in scripture that say things like God is love. But it's a question of what is the human's role in justification? What is it by which I receive the love of God in Christ? And that is faith, not my love. Okay. Let's go on here. I mean, Paul sings the praises of faith, but, but I have faith enough to move the mountains, but have not love. I'm nothing. The same Paul talks about working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Well, you'd wonder on purely Protestant grounds, if, if you've been justified by grace through faith, you've accepted the Lord as your Savior, well, what do you have to work out? And why would you do so with fear and trembling? Wouldn't you have complete, utter confidence that you're saved? Think, too, of a text like... All right, so let's let's talk about a little bit about that one real quickly. Now, um, the, the text, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, this, this certainly is a text that has been used a lot within these discussions. 
And there are, of course, different approaches to this particular text, depending on which group you're talking about. Now, Bishop Barron is just talking about Protestants in some broad sense. I'm not really concerned about that. I'm concerned about Lutherans. So, uh, it's, and in this particular issue, there is going to be a significant uh, difference in interpretation of, of that text and texts like that. Well, first I would say that there are, we have to balance out these texts that talk about things like assurance in the Christian life. So, on the one hand, we have several texts that indicate this knowledge of having peace with God through justification. We receive Christ's righteousness. We have peace with God. And we are in a state of joy. We are in a state of assurance. We see this like Romans 5.1 would be one example. And then those great, prom very well-known promises, say in Romans 8, that you know nothing can separate us from, from the love of Christ. And of course, we have in, in 1 John that great promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful, just will forgive our sins. So on the one hand, we have, and we have a number of different texts too, but we have all of these texts that place this Christian life within the context of this joy and delight and knowledge of our being set free, this peace that we have now with God that is not some some kind of state where we are in a you know kind of constant uh, fear of oh no, what if I mess up and what if I don't do enough or what if I don't you know merit enough or or whatever. So we have those texts. Uh, but then we do have warning texts and those warning texts are real. And so we do have something like work out your uh, salvation with, with fear and trembling. How does this fit with those other texts? We have to read scripture with scripture, right? And we have to acknowledge that both of those sets of texts exist. And at least within those like immediate post-Reformation era polemics. So look, you know, 19th century polemics. Uh, Rome often grabs onto those, you know, fear and trembling texts and the warning texts. And then usually in response, both the Lutheran Reformed uh, scholastics responding to the Roman Catholics are going to grab onto those kind of assurance texts. Now, of course, we have to have a balance of both. They're both in scripture. So how is it that they fit together? Well, uh, first I, I have to say that there is a kind of fear in there and tr trembling that is in the Christian life, because there is a very real possibility of, of committing apostasy. There is a very real uh, possibility of, of mortal sin, of giving in to one's sinful impulses and sinful nature to such an extent that faith is driven out and you are cut off from Christ and fall back into a sinful lifestyle. This is certainly especially true when we're looking at the early church, first century, uh, persecution is, is coming at this time. And there are there is this uh, kind of easy way out from persecution, which is to deny Christ and to deny your faith. And we should have fear and trepidation in our faith to some degree that we don't fall into that, that we don't depart from the faith, that we continually put ourselves before the means of grace, before word and sacrament, the places where God himself does does work. So there is a fear and trembling that we have, and there are uh, urges in Scripture to continue running the race, to uh, retain the faith, and to, yes, work out your salvation. Now, that particular phrase can be defined in all sorts of ways. So if what you're saying is we work out our justification, which is not what the text says, if, if how you define that is we're working out our justification as in I am increasing my own justification through my merit, which is part of the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification. Okay, well, if that's what Paul is saying, clearly that would be in opposition to what a Lutheran would understand uh, as a doctrine of justification through faith alone. So that would be a significant problem. Uh, but if you also understand this as just your salvation, which uh, the term salvation in the New Testament is broad, and it can at times refer to what we usually say is justification, but it also at times can refer to these other elements of of what we generally call the ordo salutis or the order of salvation, the different elements of what is the Christian life. And so uh, if we read this in light of, say, many of the other texts that we find it in St. Paul, such as the very famous Ephesians you know, 2, 8 through 10, uh, it's by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, let's anyone should boast. Uh, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that we may walk in them. So we have this uh, salvation or justification, uh, salvation by grace, not of your own works, which then leads to walking in the works that God has prepared beforehand. This is a working out of your salvation. God has granted 
the gift of justification. He has granted you Christ. You are conformed to Christ's image who dwells in you throughout your life, and you work that out in life, and you do that through service to the neighbor and with the recognition that if you fall into unrepentance, continual sin, that there is the very real fear of, of apostasy. But that, you know, like fear of apostasy or fear and trembling is not that which defines the attitude of the Christian. But there are times for that. This is where we read these texts within, for the Lutheran, read them in a law and gospel context with the understanding that the epistles that are being written in the New Testament are written in a particular context. And that there are times to proclaim the peace and joy that one has in Christ, uh, which are those times of, well, when you maybe don't feel that, or when you have fear, or you're dealing with depression and sorrow, and you see the effects of sin in the world, and you're struggling with your own sin and the guilt of your own sin. The person who is dealing with that kind of struggle needs the gospel, needs the peace and joy of Christ, the free forgiveness of sins. They need absolution. Uh, they need to hear, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We have the absolution. And that is what that person needs to hear. They need the gospel uh, delivered to them, proclaimed to them. They don't need to hear about and shouldn't hear in proper pastoral care about the threats of the law. However, when someone is in that position of seemingly not caring, being apathetic about their faith, not attending uh, church, not receiving the blessings of the Eucharist, not in the Word, seemingly is maybe beginning to fall back into sinful patterns of behavior, that person needs to hear those warning texts because there is the very real possibility that they can indeed be cut off or really not be cut off. It's not like God is doing this. They're cutting themselves off um, from, from Christ. So we have this law in gospel context, which is just a pastoral context. You start to understand when it is that you need those gospel promises and when it is that people need to hear those warnings and, and threats. So those two things uh, come together. They're very consistent with one another, but we have to understand the biblical text in light of what are the actual pastoral concerns of those who are who are writing these. And even when you do get the strongest warning passages, like in the book of Hebrews, you know, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, we get those very strong warning passages of, of being cut off from Christ and not coming back to repentance. Uh, you know, Hebrews 6, for example, and then the author of Hebrews also gives a gospel assurance even underneath that to say, I'm sure of better things for you. Like, I'm sure that Christ is guarding you and keeping you in the faith. So we have that that delicate balance of the law and the gospel that that we need, I think, that we see uh, Paul, Paul um, practicing here. Like Matthew 25, go outside of St. Paul. You know, when, when the, the judge at the end of time separates the sheep from the goats, the basis of the separation is not, oh, well, some had faith and others didn't. Rather, whatsoever you did to the least of my brothers, you did to me. It seems as though something like love. All right, so that, yeah, Matthew 25 text is used a lot, and, and it's not only Matthew 25. There are many texts that clearly speak about the role of works in final judgment. I mean, there, that's, that's unambiguous. Scripture is very clear that good works play a role in final judgment. And um, to say that they don't is simply to ignore the reality of what's in the text over and over again. So they're just, they do. The question is, what is that role? Now, if you are going to take this in the most straightforward way, just as, as Bishop Barrett presents it here, and you read the text, you could say, okay, well, the basis then of my salvation is, okay, have I have I clothed and fed people? And that's it. That's the one question that, you know, that, that God is going to ask, because that's the one thing Jesus presents here in this, in this particular parable. You've done those things for me. Now, of course, a Roman Catholic understands that there is a broader context that has to be placed in this as well. So, you're certainly not entering into heaven just because you have done works of service for the neighbor. That is only because you have entered into a state of grace through through holy baptism and that your sins have been forgiven. They are not imputed to you and that, you know, you have uh, done, you know, works of satisfaction, all these other kinds of things. And and the, the sacramental system of, of the, the, the Roman Catholic Church in their particular perspective has uh, has played a significant role for what happens at final judgment. In other words, this if you read this in the most, uh, I guess, contextless sense, you, you may get just a bland Pelagianism, right? Of, okay, well, did you help people or did you not? Okay, and that's it. Well, Jesus obviously is making a particular point in a particular context within the broader context of 
just this biblical theme of final judgment. And the theme that he is, uh, you know, that he is drawing upon there is tied to other places like in, in Matthew. For example, where uh, Matthew chapter 7, very famous text where Jesus speaks about those who cry, Lord, Lord, uh, and yet they are, they do not enter into the kingdom of heaven. They, they, they're bearing no fruit. And it is this theme of fruit that I think is most essential within these particular texts. So that fruit, when you look at, at fruit, if you see, for example, you know, an apple tree and it is growing apples, the growth, th those particular apples do not make the tree an apple tree. They are, uh, in other words, they, they are an accidental property of the apple tree. The apple tree remains an apple tree even if you were to take all the apples off the tree, <laughs> okay? It's still an apple tree uh, be because they're accidental, but they come out of the very nature of what is the essence of the tree is an apple tree. But, but that means that they have this kind of evidentiary value, right? So apples are evidences of the nature of what exactly the tree is. So this language of the tree and fruit, which Jesus uses consistently throughout, throughout the Gospels, is key to understanding these kinds of texts, that the fruits, those works that, that one has done, the works of love and service for the neighbor, those are the very fruits which demonstrate to the tree to be what it is. In other words, those good works are going to be that kind of evidence that demonstrates to the judge who you are, right? It's 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 evidence of your innocence, like in a courtroom, right? When you come to a courtroom, you you know you present all the evidence. Those good works, they are not what acquits you in the courtroom. You are acquitted because of Christ, but they serve an evidentiary value. They they all of the evidence of the good works that you have done demonstrates who you are as a forgiven, justified child of God, as one through whom Christ has lived His own life in in and for the benefit of of the neighbor and so there certainly is a lot more happening at final judgment than just did you do good things or did you not you know you've got and everybody goes to the thief on the cross example which of course drives me crazy because <laughs> it's well of course baptism doesn't matter because the thief on the cross didn't get baptized well um but but there is also the reality of we do know that an individual who didn't produce these profound works of love is still is still justified at the final judgment. He enters into paradise. And I won't say that he doesn't have the beginnings of love. Of course he does, because at conversion, you have the beginnings of love. The new impulses are in your heart instantaneously. There is no like temporal gap between why I have faith and I develop love later. Like this is, uh, uh, the whole package comes together. But but he didn't have those evidentiary works in, in any real specific way at all. So there's a lot more to it than, than simply that. But recognize also that when you're going before God at the final judgment, there again, this is broader context, biblical theological context, your sins are forgiven, which means that the impurities of your motives and actions when you are before the judgment seat of God are covered because they have been covered by the blood of Christ. What that means is when you are before the throne of God at final judgment, God does not judge that sin because it's been judged on Christ what is left is those fruits of the Spirit without the impurities of your sinful heart and your sinful motives. So all God sees is the, the good works that he has performed in you. As, as Augustine says, God, when he rewards our works in, in heaven, he is only crowning his own gifts. Okay, And so works do also serve that, that function. They, they serve this function of, uh, of being those things which are evidence of, of faith, which are for the benefit of the neighbor, but also are rewarded in heaven. And, and Jesus does this in the Sermon on the Mount where he, he criticizes the Pharisees for expecting earthly rewards. And his response isn't, you shouldn't be doing good work for the sake of rewards. His response is, you want a heavenly reward. We should be working for the heavenly, not the earthly rewards. So there is a reward for our good works in, in heaven. And all of these things fit perfectly fine into Matthew chapter 25, as long as you are not taking a text like Matthew 25 and saying, well, that's the entirety of anything the Bible says about justification or the final judgment. We have to read it in the context of everything else that scripture teaches. Is the criterion rather than faith. Now, my point here is not to uh, undermine those texts where Paul talks about the primacy of faith, but it, it is to complicate the matter is to say the witness of the New Testament is richly complex. How would I 
And th there's this is fair, okay? It, it is fair to say that. And it I think it is naive and just not true to say that all of this is laid out so clearly in the New Testament that, you know, through a first read of the New Testament, this would just all be really obvious. And, and to be clear, I believe in the perspicuity of Scripture, and I do believe we need the clarity of Scripture, and I do believe that justification is <laughs> by faith alone is the clear meaning of the text. But it is true that we have these various biblical realities that we have to put together. Yeah, good works play a role in final judgment. Yes, in some ways, love can even be greater than faith, but also faith justifies apart from works of the law, which includes love. These are all biblical realities that may not be the easiest thing to fit together immediately. And so the question isn't, uh, well, are there complexities here, but what system is it that makes the most sense of all of these texts together? Uh, and not talking about just guesswork of, ah, I think this one's a little better. I, I do think that the text is clear. And, and when you study the text, that you can come to a real clear conclusion about justification through faith. But I do think we want to be uh, to, to acknowledge some of the complexities and difficulties of, of these texts. Yeah, I think something like this. We're justified apart from the works of the law. What does Paul mean by the law? When a Paul's a, a Jew, he's... Okay, th and this is going to be the key to the argument, and this is key to a lot of the arguments that we find here. Uh, this was actually a, a disagreement between St. Augustine and St. Jerome, who interpreted works of the law in different ways. So uh, we'll see what Bishop Barron does with the phrase works of the law, because we have to reckon, and everybody has to reckon with this, that what Paul says in so Romans 3, 28, that we are justified by faith apart from works of the law. So... Whatever, so everyone agrees that faith justifies universally. We all agree on that. You have to because the Bible just says it word for word, right? So we all agree that faith justifies. But we also all agree that works of the law do not justify. So faith justifies, but works of the law do not justify. So then we have two questions we got to figure out. One is what is faith? And the other is what are works of the law? Okay, so like... And this is where the debate lies largely is what, how are we defining each of these, of these things? So... This is something that arise, arose in the Reformation era, um, was a debate between, as, as I said, Augustine and, and Jerome. It's also been a more recent debate with the new perspective on Paul, particularly with James Dunn, the late James Dunn, uh, in his interpretation of, of Paul's usage of works of the law aligns with, with what Bishop Barron is saying here. Uh, this is also something that I discussed in my uh, discussion with Robert Coons on the topic of, of faith and works of the law. So if you haven't seen that, there's a, you can find the whole, it's on the Intellectual Catholicism uh, channel. We did a discussion on there, but I have, I kind of broke up that particular piece of the discussion on my channel. You can find that as well. I'll try to remember to put it in the description, but sometimes I forget. All right, let's see, let's, so let's hear what, what uh, Bishop Barron says here in his definition of works of the law. Trained in the great Israelite tradition. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. He would have known all about the, uh, the complexities of Jewish law. He would have known all about temple worship, what Aquinas calls the ceremonial and juridical precepts of the law. Think here of, of again, temple sacrifice of, of priests and of, of dietary laws and, and all of the particularities by which Israelite life is defined in terms of, of clothing and diet and worship and so on. None of that. Okay. Okay. So, so here, let's do, just briefly touch on that. So he's citing Aquinas. This threefold distinction is probably given its most detailed description in Aquinas in the history of the church, but it, it, Irenaeus already talks about this quite a bit, and certainly we have evidences of this in the New Testament, but generally we've divided the law in a threefold sense, and be clear, Lutherans are part of, as part of the Western Catholic tradition, we, you know, accept this threefold division. I think it's an eminently biblical one. So we have the moral law, the ceremonial law, and then the civic law or the judicial law. And so the, the moral law, we're talking about just the essential right and wrong, the Ten Commandments. So Ten Commandments are the, the great summary of that moral law. These are the things that are what we call the eternal law, the Lex Eterna. I have a book of that title. Uh, the, the eternal law identifies those moral commands that are consistent with God's own nature. And essentially what they really are is God's nature. They are God's nature as described in moral precepts. So these are the things that are right and wrong because they reflect who God is, which means that they're unchangeable. These are the unchangeable laws. So 
lying does, cannot suddenly become right. You know, God doesn't just decide one day, well, I think lying will be bad. And, and uh, yeah, I think lying maybe is okay now. I'm going to start rewarding lying. You know, that's that's what's called a voluntarist conception that shows up with someone like William of Ockham. But that's not, that's not a historic perspective on what, what we're talking about with moral law. So the moral law is the unchanging law of God. The changing law of God, because we do have changes, these are elements of the law of God that were given for a particular purpose in redemptive history. In other words, the ceremonial laws that Bishop Barron is referring to here, these things were typological. They were pictures of Christ. And when Christ uh, fulfilled those things, when he completed his sacrificial priestly and prophetic and kingly work, those things were put to an end because they were there to portray and picture and prefigure the work of Christ. And so as Christ uh, rose from the dead, the need for these things is no longer. Um, so those, those are what we refer to as like the ceremonial laws, so sacrifices, circumcision, and those types of things. Then we have the, the juridical laws or civic laws. Those are the particular laws that God gave to the nation of Israel as an entity in order to preserve the, the nation of Israel for the coming and birth of, of the Messiah as they were identified as God's unique people. So those last two parts of the law were elements of the law that had a particular function at a particular time. They are not universal and eternal. The moral law of God is universal and it is eternal. So what Bishop Barron is trying to get at here is he's trying to, to ask the question, which is a totally valid and good question to ask. When Paul is talking about works of the law, which of those is he referring to? Is he referring to the entirety of the law, meaning including that that moral law, that eternal law, or is Paul referring specifically to those ju judicial or ceremonial elements of the law when he's talking about works of the law? How come? Not because it's bad in itself, but because now it's been caught up into Christ. All of that is now seen as an anticipation of what happened through the cross of Jesus. So we're not saved by those works of the law because Christ in his dying and rising has taken all that up into himself. Read now the letter to the Hebrews for all the details on that point. So it seems to me that's clear in Paul that he means we're not saved by those works. But how about the moral law of Israel? Well, Aquinas would speak for the mainstream of the Catholic tradition in saying even though those other laws have been taken up in, into a higher synthesis, the moral law taught to Israel remains. And it is indeed relevant to our salvation. Now, look at Paul again here in 13 as he goes on. Okay, so let's, let's break that down. Okay, so he's saying here, Essentially, the argument that he's trying to make is what Paul is really talking about when he says justification apart from works of the law is we are justified apart from those ceremonial works of the law. He's not saying that we are justified apart from good works in general, meaning we are not, it's not that we are justified apart from our, the, the works that are in accord with the moral law of God. And the language he uses is interesting. He says it's relevant to our salvation. So, of course, wh what does that mean that is relevant to our salvation? That could be interpreted in a number of different ways. But just to clarify here, as he's defining what is the, the Catholic tradition, he means the Roman Catholic tradition, that the there is a continuance of the moral law. That's the Lutheran tradition too. <laughs> okay, so Luther, this is why Martin Luther gives the Ten Commandments as the first part of his small and large catechism as things to be obeyed. And he, this is like the first thing that we teach our, our children when we teach them about the faith is the uh, eternal validity of the moral uh, commands of God as set forth in the moral law, and which generally we refer to as the Ten Commandments. And why I say generally is that there are, at least with the Sabbath principle, there is still a ceremonial element that is found there in, in the uh, Ten Commandments themselves. So that generally they are this reflection of the of the eternal moral will of God, but they still are given in an, in, a, in a theocratic Israelite context, which means you have this element of the Sabbath that is that is fulfilled in Christ, and you also have this promise of the people of Israel living long in the land that's there. So you have elements of a particular redemptive history there, but in general, especially Romans thirteen, you see this in the way 
which is the text he's preaching on here, in the way that Paul does go back to that moral law with the assumption of, yeah, these things are still valid. This is still the way that God operates. This is more than simply ceremony, uh, but these are this is the moral will of God. All right, so with that being said then, let's talk about what works of the law are in Paul. So the question is, in the book of Romans, and in the book of Galatians as well, but we're talking Romans because that's what he's, he's preaching on here. So in the book of Romans, what is it that defines works of the law? When Paul refers to the law, is, he, is there evidence here that he is talking specifically about ceremonial works, or do we find evidence that Paul is talking about works of the law in a more general sense? The book of Galatians is one that is specifically dealing with questions of circumcision and those of food laws because you have a certain group of people that requires those things for for justification and so Paul spends a significant amount of time talking about yes the ceremonial law more so in Galatians and Romans but that's not to say that Paul doesn't do that in Romans and Paul certainly does that in Romans and Paul is concerned very obviously with the relationship between Jews and Gentiles Romans chapter 9 through 11 deal with the question of what happens to Israel now in the church? How do does the church relate to the nation of Israel? How do the Gentiles uh, relate to the nation of Israel? And clearly, Paul is very concerned with these kinds of questions. And certainly, the doctrine of justification and what we're talking about with justification does play a role in that conversation. Paul is concerned to answer questions like, who, is, who are the children of Abraham? Is it just those who do those kind of ritual works and are brought into the, the Abrahamic covenant through circumcision? Or is it those who are part of the family of Abraham through faith? That is certainly part of what Paul's concern is here. That's not the entirety of what Paul's concern is here, though. So, I want to look at a number of texts within the book of Romans to say, when Paul's talking about the law, is he just talking about the ceremonial law? Or does he have in mind what is the broader moral law of God. Well, let's look at, uh, just starting in, in Romans chapter 2, and I'm just going to bounce around here a little bit, but uh, Romans chapter chapter 1, Paul has this clear condemnation of the Gentiles. He introduces this theme first, the righteousness of God, but then the righteousness of God is is revealed against the unrighteousness of man. The unrighteousness of man is demonstrated in the uh, the subversion of the created order. So that includes first the subversion of idolatry and worship so that idols are worshipped rather than the God who should be worshipped, right? We, we move from looking up toward God, our creator, to the created things and worship those. There's this subversion in, in uh, male-female relationships that's that's mentioned here. And then this leads basically to what is a condemnation primarily of the Gentiles. Then we get to in chapter two, this condemnation of the Jewish people as well, that though though they had, you know, received the law in this special way, they also they also have not obeyed the law. But within chapter two, and this is right before he starts, uh, Paul starts speaking about the Jewish people, he says this um, in verse 14, and yeah, we've got that 12 and 13, and I know that's really relevant to this conversation. I I'm, I'm, know it's there, and I'm not ignoring it, but it's just that I would have to devote more time to it than I have right now. But I would love to talk about that, and maybe we'll do a separate program. Um, okay, uh, but let's see. For 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law, so they don't have the law in the sense that they don't have this revealed law that God has given them, they do by nature things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts, and accusing or else excusing them. So whatever it is that Paul is referring to as law when talking about the Jewish people here is something that is reflected within the conscience of the Gentiles. And it is something that they do. They do the works of the law by nature because there is a law written on the heart. That gives you an idea of what Paul means when he's using the term namas or law here. And the question is, is Paul talking about the Gentiles having a knowledge of the ceremonial law here in Jewish identity? Or is Paul talking here about the Gentiles having a knowledge of general moral right and wrong, which seems to pretty clearly be the case. And if that's the case, that's what Paul means here by law, is, is whatever he means by law is that which is reflected within the heart of the Gentiles and the natural actions of the Gentiles. 
So I don't think there's any reason to believe this to be something like circumcision or, or other ceremonial acts. And here's another point that I want to bring out here. This is in verse uh, chapter 3, verses uh, 19 through 20. Uh, and I will say, 3 verse 1, he talks about circumcision. So Paul clearly is speaking at least to some extent about ceremonial law. He talks about circumcision. Everybody acknowledges that. But the question is, is that all he's talking about is ceremonial law, or is he talking about law as a whole, including moral law? And I think that inclusion of the Gentiles makes that clear. But let's look at 19 and 20, because this becomes even, even clearer. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So he's talking about those who have received the law, who are under the law, is he talking just about the Jewish people? Because if he's talking uniquely about ceremonial law or, or even civic law and Jewish identity, who is that? Who was under the law? Well, only the Jews. The Gentiles didn't receive the law. So is Paul talking about like Jewish partiality here or is he talking about something else? Okay, then he says, says to those who are under the law, that what? Every mouth may be stopped. Every mouth. So he moves from under law, condemned under law, Every mouth is stopped. We are all guilty before the law, before God under his law. And next, all the worlds may become guilty before God. So he's clearly not talking in this discussion of law uh, about just the ceremonial law of the Israelites. It is, is eminently clear that he's talking about something that refers to the entire world because it condemns the whole world. The entire earth, all people that exist are under this law and are guilty under this law. It is not just about circumcision. It is about the moral law that is written on the heart of the Gentiles, which is given in, in a lesser sense through that natural revelation than it is in the fullest sense given through special revelation to the Israelites. Then, verse 20 because it's, we could say, okay, well, that's law there, but what about works of the law? What does the phrase works of the law mean? 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law or by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, look, works of the law in 20, verse 20 is referencing those works mentioned in verse 19 that condemn the whole world under which all people are guilty. This is this kind of crescendo of the argument that Paul has been making since the beginning of the book. And that means that the idolatry that he's talking about, the, the sexual promiscuity that he's talking about in chapter one, those things are elements of, an evidence of the Gentiles disobeying the works of the law which is where this universal condemnation comes in. So clearly we are talking about something that is beyond simply civic law or, or ceremonial law given to the Israelites. Therefore, by the works of the law, no flesh, right? No flesh. There is no justification in God's sight by the works of the law. So if Paul is not just talking about ceremonial works, this right here is a very clear testimony to sola fide because he's saying that that by no by no works of the law can anyone be justified in god's sight and if we take romans 13 which is what bishop Barron is preaching on seriously and what paul says is the fulfillment of the law is love then we go back to this and say if paul is being consistent with his use of language and his argument which I think he is. And to be clear, Paul does use things like the term law a bunch of different ways in Romans. But um, but here, it's very clear he's defining the law in the same way that we look at in Romans in Romans 13. We could talk about why that's the case as compared to the other uses of law, like when he uses it as more something like principle. It's not what Paul's doing there, He's which, which we know because he's outlining specific, these are the commandments of God and this is how you fulfill them, Romans 13, love. Okay, and here, He's, you could essentially translate this in a way, not like a literal translation, but you could uh, consistently say and identifying these two texts is speaking about the same thing. We could say that through love, no one will be justified in God's sight. For by law, which is fulfilled in love, so by the commandments of love comes the knowledge of sin. So through the law comes the knowledge that we are sinners. Is it just that through the ceremonial law we come to a knowledge of sin? Well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, to, not that that's totally untrue, right? We do have like, okay, the sacrifices do tell us that uh, our sin 
is pretty serious because, you know, something has to die as a substitute for us. So it tells us we're sinners. Not what Paul is talking about here. There's no discussion of the sacrificial system here at all. There is more general moral claims about both uh, Gentiles and Jewish people. So then... When we get to verse 21, when when Paul says the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by law and prophets, that's where he uses law to refer to the Old Testament books of Moses, law and prophets being a summary of the Old Testament text, the Tanakh, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe for there is no difference. Uh, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And we can go more throughout this, but so what he's what he's clearly saying here is that we can't be justified by deeds of the law, which includes this universal moral law because it condemns the whole world, but we are justified by something else, and that is faith through the righteousness of God. So our justification comes not through our obedience to the law, but we see here through grace in the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this is why we get that discussion of boasting, right? Where is the boasting? It's excluded. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Just works in general. Note that he uses the phrase works here. Um, he doesn't just say by ceremonial ceremonial works. But then he does go on to discuss the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in verses 29 and 30. And this is where some of the confusion lies. And it because there there clearly is an element of Paul saying we're, if we're justified through faith not by law that means we can't boast in our works and our goodness in general. And that's, you know, the we have parallels to this that we know aren't about Jews and Gentiles. Ephesians 2:8 through 10, which I cited earlier. Everyone acknowledges that has that that's not about Jews and Gentiles. It's a general principle of being saved apart from works. Titus chapter 3 has a very similar text. Uh, 1 Timothy has a similar text. There, so there are a number of other biblical texts in Paul that uh, everyone agrees, both Roman Catholic and, and Protestant interpreters, that don't have specifically the ceremonial, ceremonial law in mind. But certainly part of this justification apart from law, also Paul is trying to get at the point that the Jews had boasted in the fact that they had the law of God in a way the Gentiles didn't. The Gentiles just have this law of nature, but the Jewish people had the revealed law of God. However, if we're not justified by law, it puts Jews and Gentiles on the same ground because it it doesn't really matter because none of you are getting justified by the law. And it's faith that becomes this great equalizer because if we are all justified by faith, that means that however much law you got from God in special revelation or how much you've obeyed any of the law, whether it's moral, civil, or ceremonial, none of that plays a role within um, in justification. And, uh, you know, then we have this, this discussion in Romans chapter 4 where Paul continues to talk about this with the example of Abraham. And I really think verse four, and I know I talk about this all the time and, and I just harp on this over and over again, but I think it's so key. And that is Romans 4, 4. To him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. That's really the, the key. It's such a key text because it just does not fit well within a Roman interpretation. Now, there are Roman interpretations that do try to use this text in a way that's consistent with their theology. Um, some Roman interpreters that I have encountered like to just say, ah, this text has been overemphasized, <laughs> but there's a reason it's been emphasized so much. But it is that language of, of debt here that is that is key because in wages, debt, it puts justification in a broader context than ethnic identification or of uh, the covenant people of Israel into a broader context of Working for something and getting it because it's owed to you versus not working and receiving it as a gift. That, that's certainly broader than this question of ethnic identification or ceremonial law. All right, then we have this uh, David describing in Psalm 32, this blessedness of the one who God imputes for righteousness apart apart from works, where he's not really talking about anything that has anything to do with ceremonial law at all. This is David confessing his sins and receiving forgiveness. This is just blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. In other words, this is telling us that the the question of justification is really the question of forgiveness. This is a question of are your sins counted to you or are they forgiven? This is not 
dealing with, you know, things like ethnic inclusion into the covenant people of Israel, as someone like N.T. Wright likes to emphasize here. Um, and then we do then move, though, from the broader, and this is what, why this becomes difficult. We move from broad principles like that um, of, you know, apart from works altogether, not earning something, then to specifics of how this relates to the Jewish people. Then we see, verse 9, does the blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or the uncircumcised? So we have this question of circumcision versus versus uncircumcision. And so these the broader theme is then applied in the particular to say, if this is the case that we're not earning anything and this has nothing to do with works at all or anything that we can boast in, now what, what does that mean about circumcision versus uncircumcision? Well, we're on the same ground, circumcised or uncircumcised. Then... Uh, there are a number of other things that, that I can point at to point at this broader definition of law here. And the first, uh, another one of these is Romans chapter 5. Um, Romans chapter 5 speaks about, and I, don't, I know I don't have the time to get into all of this. Romans chapter 5 speaks about the nature of Adam and this connection between Adam and Israel. The, uh, the, the, the Adam received a law and broke that law. And what he's referring to something is 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 something creational here. This is not about ethnic identification. This is something that the law was given as the first commandment uh, to, to Adam and what happens to Adam affects us all. So there's something something broad and, and universal about this. There's a really great um, dissertation written on this by a guy named Chris Vlachos, uh, which is fantastic. I think outlining this argument extremely well wh and why this particular text really, really matters for this conversation. But then we also have Romans chapter 7, and this is very important for this conversation, is Paul discusses how it is that he came to a knowledge of, of his sin and, well, essentially discovered the righteousness that is apart from, from law, the righteousness that is found in Christ, uh, you know, how the law cannot save us. And when doing this, Paul gives a very specific application of the law. How is it that he started to understand that the law can't justify? Well, he says here in verse 7, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. So he's going to say, give an example of what the law is that he's been talking about this whole time. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. Apart from law, sin was dead. Uh, I was, once was alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. So Paul goes on here to identify the law with one particular commandment. And it's not ceremony at all. It, it's like the, the least ceremonial. It's it's the, the end of the Ten Commandments. You know, this is the law that we would probably find, you know, least offensive, like coveting. That's like not that big of a deal. Come on. And he identifies that as the law which does not justify, uh, which instead brings a knowledge of sin. And again, just gives the... Uh, I just say, just say gives the impression of, but it like makes it clear that what Paul has in mind here is not just civic law or um, ceremonial law that he is including the moral law. If it certainly if it includes, includes coveting, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. Whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in saying this: you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice, please, he's not talking about the ceremonial, dietary, juridical precepts of ancient Israel. We know that those are not relevant now to our salvation. But he's talking indeed about the moral law, the moral law, which remains. It remains in place. What he's saying here is all of that moral law is summed up in the great commandment to love. Now, let's go back to another Pauline text that Catholic theology has insisted upon. Paul, in fact, never says that we are justified by faith alone. In fact, you want to find the only time that's mentioned in the New Testament is the letter of James, and it's explicitly condemned. What does Paul, in fact, say? What matters, he says, is faith expressing itself in love. What matters is faith expressing itself in love. It seems to me that's the best summary of the complexity of Paul's position. 
Now, let me let me put some more meat on the. All right. So, and I know we're we're about out of our out of time here, so we'll probably end with with this here. Um, so he's going to cite you know Galatians five faith. Uh, well, th- this is going to be uh, defined by. Uh, in Roman Catholic theology is faith that is formed by love. So faith justifies, but the faith that justifies is formed by love. And, and this is something that can seem like maybe a bit of a, um, you know, something that maybe is, is a little nitpicky. Uh, it's, it's viewed that way, at least, when Lutherans are very adamant that faith and love do go together hand in hand, as Paul says, and what matters is faith working through love. Um, but, it's, but faith does not find its completion in love. Faith does not justify in any way because it loves or because it has love, though faith always does have love as this other benefit of Christ, the love that is poured out in our hearts that works itself out in the world. However, it doesn't play a role in our in our justification. And what uh, Bishop Barron is referring to there in, in Galatians is a text where Paul is talking specifically about the question of circumcision. So he says, you know, circumcision or uncircumcision is nothing. What really matters, what matters is, is faith. Uh, you know, we're working through love. So Paul is in that context talking about the question of Jewish uh, superiority over Gentiles within the community of the church. And his response is, well, he first laid out his response continually throughout that letter that it's faith that justifies, not law. And if it's not law that justifies, that also means that having the ceremonial law like circumcision does not make you superior. We're, we're on this kind of equal ground through justification by faith. But then if we're talking about what it means to be a Christian and have Christian obedience, what really matters is not circumcision in the new covenant. What matters is faith that works through love. This, this is what matters. In Romans 13, Paul's very clear that this is what matters. However, as I've said repeatedly, this says nothing about justification. Nothing in Romans 13 implies that it is that love that he defines here that is something that justifies, as I think has been clearly demonstrated throughout this this program here as we've walked through the book of Romans, is that indeed this proves the opposite point. Because if what Paul is referring to as works of the law includes moral works of the law, and those moral works of the law are in fact summarized by love— then the entirety of Paul's argument in Romans 3 and 4 is essentially the argument that faith justifies and love does not, if that's how he means works of the law. Well, uh, I hope you found this beneficial as we walked through some of these uh, some of these texts in St. Paul. And uh, I hope that those of you who had sent me this talk, a number of you have sent me this talk, have found some, some answers here and appreciate Bishop Barron's uh, attempt to uh, be, you know, fair, and he's usually pretty measured in how he deals with these things as well. Um, but hopefully, you'll learn something. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video. God bless. Mm-hmm.